also the uh, author of multiple textbooks. Right here. If you take it my class, you'll recognize this one. And um, one very cool thing about these textbooks is uh, they not only convey content, but they also have the effect of sort of introducing one community to the other. So these textbooks as a way of letting life scientists understand what is and is not a well-formed competition problem, what is and is not a tractable competition problem, and it is, but it also teaches computer scientists things like what do, you know, what were the famous life science experiments that told us what we to know about biology and genetics, and what are the questions biologists are trying to address today. So, without further ado, I give you the Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. It actually is the first time I came here was 20 years ago. And I think Stephen was a, a fresh assistant professor at that time, and he's here again. Uh, anyway, uh, today I will talk about genome assembly. And people in this room probably think about genome assembly as one-dimensional overlapping puzzle. I will try to convince you that it is actually a two-dimensional puzzle. And to explain how it, why it is a two-dimensional puzzle, I will do the following. In the first part of my talk, usually people first talk about uh, methods and then talk about results. I will switch it. I will first talk about results, and then in the second part of the talk, I will, tr I will describe assembly of puzzles. Okay? But first, you may be wondering why this puzzle shows the most famous church in St. Petersburg is actually the site of the first terrorist attack in Russia when the most progressive ever Russian Tsar was assassinated. Uh, and the church was built at this place. The reason I'm starting from this is because uh, what I will be presenting today started four years ago when I went for sabbatical in Russia. And I was given an opportunity to build a lab in bioinformatics. So at that time, St. Petersburg, which is a city of 5 million, was a bioinformatics desert. There was no uh, bio, single bioinformatics class in the city at that time. Uh, and this is despite the fact that St. Petersburg University is a great institution that produced quite a number, even recently, Fields Medal winners and Nobel Prize winners. Uh, so the question was, how can you establish a computational biology lab in a country where at that time there was no single world class computer science department or biology department? And I basically went to the street and hired to the lab very young people. Mo they mainly, mostly had degrees in mathematics and algebra. Some of them had a degree in computer science. Some of them were, at that time, finishing their undergraduate degree, and I think the average age was 22 or 23. So uh, uh, there was no, only one of them actually defended PhD shortly afterwards here. And the remaining seven are about to defend their PhDs next year. So they basically started uh, four years ago. And I realized that these are, these are people who knew nothing about bioinformatics. Uh, and I realized that it's very important to set up a problem for them with a very clear milestone. So they would know that they will either fail or solve it. And I thought that the good problem for this is the problem of developing an, an assembler. And people may think, well, assembler is a very difficult, one of the technically most challenging uh, problems, both software implementation and algorithmically. But amazingly, they actually succeeded. They developed Assembler. The assembler was working in half a year after I arrived there. Uh, and uh, it turned out that it is now the most, they, it was, they published their first paper three years ago, and it turned out to be the most well-cited paper in Russia in the last three years. Uh, and space is, has now become quite popular, and it is set up with different cloud services. And afterwards, there were different, they started developing different variations of space because, as you know, there are many different 
applications, and I will talk a little bit about these applications, but first, what is space? So this is our first paper with biological applications of space, and it doesn't look like uh, this is a strange cover for genome research. It looks more like, more like advertisement for bathroom appliances companies. Uh, but it is actually a research paper because at that time, uh, Craig Venter wanted to analyze pathogens in hospital. And he sent somebody to one of the best San Diego hospital bathrooms to collect samples and try to figure out what is there. Well, the problem is why it is an important problem. It is an important problem because most bacteria that we know cannot be sequenced. Because to sequence bacteria, you have to cultivate it. In only a small fraction, you, so to, do, to send, to use Illumina machine for sequencing, you need to have at least a million cells to conduct traditional sequencing. Since for li the lion's share of bacteria, it is actually not possible today to cultivate them, the only way would be to sequence from single cells. And that's how this experiment was done. It was done thanks to the first robotic station for single cell sequencing that is able to process huge number of cells. So it actually was the first high throughput single cell sequencing experiments. And from this point, we've done, uh, we figured out that there are some quite unusual pathogens hiding in a typical hospital uh, bathroom, restroom. Uh, and then very quickly, we were very pleased that independently of us, people uh, at uh, Cambridge started sequencing chlamydia, which is the most uh, common sexually transmitted disease that is almost impossible to clone, so it's very difficult. Single cell sequences remain arguably one of the few ways to learn something about populations of chlamydia. And then we switch to sequencing so-called dark matter of bacterial life. Half of uh, classes of bacteria today never been sequenced because nobody figured out how to sequence them. And in the last two, three years, since to single cell sequencing, we're actually getting a window into this world of bacteria that otherwise people saw only from 16S RNA but never had a glimpse into their genomes. That was the first study where essentially nearly all genes in a bacteria that never was cultivated was, were assembled by single cell sequencing. Uh, and uh, how do we do this? How spades work? Of course, it's based on the construction of the Debrain graph, as everything uh, we've been doing. Uh, and when we started, of course, there was no shortage of Debrain graph assemblers, but none of them has been working for single cell sequencing. And so my first order of business for St. Petersburg team was actually to develop the first single cell assembly. And assembly is generally a rather complex task that consists of many different subtasks. And from the very beginning, it was clear that we had to rewrite most of this task for single cell sequencing, and we've done it. So spades is essentially heavily rewritten uh, assembly pipeline, and all follow-up work here is based on this original development. It turned out that after the basic functions of assembly are rewritten, many applications become possible, not only single cell assembly, and I will uh, explain how we can branch to other areas. But what is special about single cell assembly? So first, a few words about single cell assembly, uh, single cell sequencing. Uh, Roger Laskin, our collaborator, is kind of a uh, father of single cell sequencing. Uh, he came up with his multiply displacement amplification techniques almost 15 years ago. It has been commercialized and now became, has become routine. Uh, so uh, basically, MDI is a 
copy machine, very uh, promiscuous copy machine that, however, is less precise and less accurate than the traditional copies, copy machine used in genomics. I won't go into the details of MDA. Let's just say that it, it introduces more artifacts than traditional amplification techniques, but it allows to amplify a single cell to make genomic equivalent of a single cell that represents millions of uh, mu uh, material multiplied by millions from a single cell. Of course, single cell is destroyed after this uh, amplification, uh, but we then afterwards can simply send this material to aluminum machine as usual. Okay? Uh, anyway, so why assembly of single cell data is challenging? First, there are orders of magnitude differences in coverage. So on the top is traditional picture for coverage across E. coli genome, and you see that coverage is nearly uniform at 600. That's how it looks like for single cell E. coli. And if you look at the traditional assemblers, implicitly or explicitly behind them, there is an assumption for uniform coverage. If you look at the error correction procedures, that often pre uh, precedes uh, assembly. In, once again, usually explicitly behind them, there is an assumption of uniform coverage. So this doesn't work. So we actually learned how to deal with this uh, single cell coverage. Our first attempt was uh, four years ago, even before I came to St. Petersburg, uh, in this paper, but then spades, uh, and so we, we, when we've done it, it was clear that it's kind of temporary fix, and SPADES is essentially a uh, special assembler designed to deal with this artifact, and then uh, IDBA-UD, another assembler emerged that uh, also from University of Hong Kong that also addresses this non-uniform coverage. So that was done. But however, another significant part of difficulties is abundance of chimeric reads. So here, uh, green reads come from region, let's say, of chromosome one. Blue reads come from region of chromosome seven, but they're artificially, chimerically combined together. And there are red reads here that are not really present in the genome, but you do not know, and as a result, it confuses the De Bruyne graph of genome. I'm not defining the De Bruyne graph yet, but I will later in the second part of the talk. Yes? Do you ever have two reads that have exactly the same chimera? Absolutely, yeah. Well, I said two reads that have exactly the same chimera are close reads that confirm the same chimeric junction. In the context of MDA, it is very clear why it is happening, yes? Horizontal axis here. Yes. It is E. coli genome, position in E. coli genome. And on Y axis, it's the coverage at this position. So at every position here, coverage is roughly 600. And in this case, coverage varies from zero to thousands. It's actually cut out here. Now, if you look at the assembly paper, very few assemblers actually pay attention or care to chimeric reads. It doesn't mean that chimeric reads are not present in traditional assembly problem. They, d they are present. But since they are present in kind of small quantities, people feel it's OK. They, maybe they know that it le they lead to deterioration of assembly quality, but not too much of deterioration. In case of single cell assembly, it leads to dramatic deterioration of assembly quality because the number of chimeric reads may be huge. Okay. Now, and actually, I think the first paper which seriously deal to this chimeric read, we, uh, this is the paper that we published a couple of years ago in Recomp, uh, and it, there are currently in spades, there are actually five different, different types of procedures to deal with chimeric reads, starting from topological analysis of the graph and applying flows in network algorithms to a number of other things. So it's a major challenge 
for single cell sequencing that people in traditional assembler actually did not see. Now, uh, so what is, what is the goal of single, maybe I should say a few words. So traditional uh, bacterial population are studied by metagenomics. But metagenomics gives you access to many species and very few genes. Single cell sequencing, on the other hand, allows you to avoid this gene-centric view and goes to genome-centric view. And uh, the, uh, recently, the, uh, basically what we showed after this space assembler was developed, that we can capture in single cell project 96% of the genome, if we are lucky, and routinely capture over 90% of the genome. And in many applications, I'm actually working on in proteomics or let's say in uh, antibiotics discovery. That's pretty much all you need. It's as, nearly as good as the complete genome. So after we developed the sampler, we decided to test it, and we test, yes? It's different, I mean, single cell, as soon as you run it, it's destroyed, so there will be no, and it will be different for every single cell you do again. It, it may be correlated with the sequence, but the, it's not necessarily that there is consistent non-uniform coverage or consistent chimeras. Yes? Yeah. So I guess if I get a few numbers on, on the problem. So I see this graph shows 4.7, that means he has millions of... Yeah, it's uh, millions of nucleotides of E. coli. Yeah, okay, and, this so, yeah, okay. and then E3 is about seven, or what is it, about seven nucleotides? Let's say 100. Or, oh, it could be 100. Actually. Yeah. For a single cell, you routine, on average, let's say you have coverage 600. So uh, you get 600 reads? No, no, you have as many, I don't know how many reads you get, but you get as many reads that it provides you coverage on average, let's say 600 or 500 or 200 for every position. Oh, 200 reads per position on Yeah. But some of those positions might have zero reads. Yes. Have yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here's the comparison of uh, traditional assembler and single cell assemblers. And you can see that single cell assemblers greatly outperform traditional assembler in assembling single cells. So, and this is shows both spades and IDBA UD assemblers. So they essentially have become the standard in single cell sequencing. Uh, and after we've done this, I want to talk, so this assembler was originally developed for single cell, but can it be transformed into normal cell? So without any changes, when we run this single cell assembler on traditional data, it turns out that the results are the same. The single cell assembler still beats traditional assemblers. Also, the difference is small because all this assembler already operate at the, almost at the limit of what is possible. Uh, but there are differences, and I think these differences are mainly due to the fact that traditional assembler do not pay much attention to chimeras, because there are still chimeric reads in traditional projects. Uh, and maybe there are also some advantages to kind of software de details of software design and some non-uniformity that is also present. So this space from the very beginning was actually available as both single cell assembler and traditional assembler. However, people started doing crazy things with space. They started applying it to metagenomics data, to transcriptomics data, and we actually put a disclosure uh, in our readme find, please do not use it, with this data set that space was not designed for. But people didn't listen. And we were getting like email, well, I've got this metagenomics assembly with space, it's so great. Thank you. Finally, we decided to look how spades work, let's say, with our NASIC assembly. And this is spades without any changes. As a de novo transcriptomics assembler, benchmark against the leading de novo transcriptomics assembly tool. And you can see that it, strangely enough, performs actually significantly better 
than Trinity, that is the tool that is commonly used. Then we decided to invest some efforts into further development uh, of spades and uh, or into trans spades because uh, there are definitely some things that are specific to transcriptomic systems that have to be addressed. And after a few changes, this is this mouse RNA seq assembly, the same picture. So what, why is it happening? Well, why does space perform well assembling transcriptome? Space is designed for non-uniform coverage and chimeric read. And transcriptome assembly is exactly about non-uniform coverage. And also, in transcriptome assembly, there is quite a number of chimeric reads of special type. And there is no mentioning of chimeric reads in any of transcriptome <laughs> assembly papers. So that's where space takes advantage by dealing with these, these chimeric reads. So afterwards, we decided that maybe, maybe we should try to turn space into a universal assembler that will do different things. And what I will try to talk about today is that our work on transforming space for true long synthetic reads for an exterior made pair is a new sample preparation technology from Illumina for iron torrent and for combination of uh, Pugbuyer and Oxford nanopolar technologies. So once again, like uh, people are doing crazy things. We developed this part for Pugbuyer, uh, combination uh, uh, hybrid spades for combination of Pugbuyer and spades. But as soon as nanopolar technology came up, <laughs> People applied to nanopore technology and published a paper by uh, using hi hybrid spades to assemble uh, illuminates jointly with these nanopore. That actually was the first nanopore paper demonstrating utility of uh, nanopore signals. Uh, so let me show, before I move to uh, algorithmic part, let me show, uh, say a little bit more about true synthetic long creeds because it's relatively new technology. I don't know how many people are, uh, in the room are familiar with the technology. Two? Oh, three. Okay. Five. All right. So true synthetic long creed is to some extent an attempt to respond to Pacific biosciences long creed. And this technology arised from Illumina acquiring a startup called Molecular a little over a year ago. And the goal is to produce, in difference from Pug reads that are long but inaccurate, the goal is to produce 10 kilobasis reads that are long and extremely accurate, more accurate than traditional Illumina reads. So how, how this technology works? Well, it starts from uh, fragmenting DNA and separating it into barcode bin. And each bin contains roughly 300 fragments of length 10 kb each. So think about every bin as an equivalent of 3 million bases microbial gen. Okay? But it's taken from different parts of human genome. Right? It's 300 fragments taken from different chromosomes of human genome. Then, fragments in each bin are amplified and sequenced. And then, uh, there is a step that is called barcode assembly. You need to assemble each bin into context. Ideally, from each context, you expect 300 reads, each read 10 kilobytes long, right? And then afterwards, after you constructed these reads, the last step is how to assemble them into continuous gen. Uh, so let's focus. We work both on barcode assembly step and genome assembly step from barcode from this uh, long synthetic reads. But let's focus on a single barcode step. Given a single barcode, how to assemble reads in this barcode into uh, 310 KB fragments. Now, how is it different from assembling a bacterial site genome? And why spades is a good assembler for this task? 
his coverage, traditional genome coverage, it's a different view than I showed before, in traditional standard multi-cell projects. And in this case, uh, this is KMER coverage on x-axis and on y-axis is frequency of this KMER coverage. So people who use Quake know very well this plot. For most position of the genome, the coverage is roughly the same, roughly around, around 200 KB, 200, uh, 200 X, right? And this is very important for different stages of assembly. This is single cell coverage by KMERS. So distribution is completely different, and that's why many procedures for error correction and for genome assembly do not work for single cell. Now I wanted to show you how the coverage look like for true SAC technology. It looks almost the same as single cell coverage. So everything we learned for single cell assembly will be applied here. Okay? Now, another thing, chimeric reads. So what is often happening in synthetic long grids is that during the amplification process, uh, amplification goes on one strand, then jumps a little bit ahead to the different strand and start going in a different direction. It creates terrible artifacts for the De Bruyne graph that needs to be detected and eliminated. But SPADES has been designed to do this. So this is a good thing, but there are also bad things indicating that SPADES actually will not work well for this data set because there is a large number of coverage breaks. It's unusual because this fragment are taken from different parts of the genome. And they tr actually trigger, in combination with chimeric reads, they trigger uh, assembly errors during De Bruyne graph construction. And since the resulting De Bruyne graph has many erroneous edges, repeat uh, resolution procedure also result in erroneous results. So let me give you just one of the challenges. So these are two 10 KB fragment. The first of them ends with a repeat, and the last of them starts with, allu, let's say, allure repeats, okay? And then there is a extend a little bit over this allure repeats. When you construct the brain graph from this fragment, you will have something like this. <laughs> so there is this green start of the second fragment will result in little tip. And red end of this fragment will result in a little tip here. What traditional assemblers do with tips? They cut them. You cut this tip, this is an assembly error. And this is very frequent. So how we deal with this problem, we figure out how to address them. Uh, we modified spades quite a bit. And here's the result for TrueSec human genome assembly. Uh, it's, you shouldn't look at this table in the same way you look at a traditional assembly result. N50 is almost irrelevant here. I'll tell you what's relevant. These two columns uh, are relevant. And these two columns is basically how much of the genome, of this virtual pseudobacterial genome, you recover as a relatively long read of size 1.5 kilobases larger, and you actually recover 2.5 megabase in long, very accurate reads from this data. Okay? And then, this is also important, is how much of super long read, almost 10 KB, you recover from this data. And it turns out that out of 300, you require 100, roughly 40% of them are indeed extremely accurate long reads. Okay? So there is a lot of excitement about this technology with respect to detecting human variation. But there is even more excitement in metagenomics community, and I will show you why. Because I think this, this provides, met, my metagenomics friends think that it's a real revolution uh, in genomics. So in the beginning, I was telling you that deficiency, traditional deficiency of metagenomics is very gene-centric. It doesn't allow you to extract the whole genome from bacterial samples. Let me show you what 
true synthetic clone creates allow you to extract from a meta complex metagenomic sample something that Pacific Biosciences definitely cannot do. Here's our result of assembly of metagenomics read. Take a look at the longest context. These are megabases. So we take metagenomics data set and the longest context in the resulting metagenomics assembly are over one megabase. And there is huge, by the way, each of this table, like the table I showed you before, is the result of assembly of hundreds and hundreds of barcodes. It's not just one, but it's maybe the most extensive benchmarking ever done in bacterial genomics, I mean pseudobacterial genomics, uh, because uh, there are a huge number of barcodes that we analyze. It's average numbers for barcode. So uh, the number of fragments of lens exceeding 500 calibases is very large. So that's what metagenomics people are looking for. So the task detecting, let's say, dark matter of life, if previously it required single cell sequencing, but how would you pick the right cell for single cell sequencing that represents dark matter of life? So that's, there is a number of sampling questions here. It is really in an unbiased way addressed here. So we are very excited about this, how this, will, this, this approach may potentially change metagenomics, and it's actually cheaper to generate uh, true sex sequencing runs and to generate uh, Pacific Biosciences run. Okay, I think the time has come to switch into algorithmic part, and I will tell you uh, a little bit about what we've been doing with this next era, just to motivate it, with this next era mate pairs. Last year, uh, we presented an uh, expander algorithm at ISMB, and expander is essentially uh, an approach to repeat resolution, how to utilize mate pairs. And the motivation for this was a new sample, prepara new sample preparation approaches that are developing, have been developing at Illumina and a number of other companies independently. And the goal is to increase the size of insert, but at the same time for re uh, mate pairs, but at the same time to make distribution of insert sizes very, very tight. And to some extent, this goal has been achieved experimentally today. You can generate insert of lens 10 KB. That's nothing new. But all previous attempts to generate such uh, read pairs resulted in a very uh, ugly distribution of insert lens. And assemblers, as a result, had difficulty utilizing this. So there is a new stage in this kind of approaches. And the goal at Illumina is actually to assemble let's say, bacterial genome into a single context by just generating one library. It's, there is a very simple generation, uh, next era made by generation protocol. So this is, would, in this case, would be more efficient than sequencing genomes through PacBio technology. So Expander is an attempt to do this. And Expander is actually kind of a new twist on the uh, idea that we introduced a couple of years ago that is called the rectangle graph. And I, will, I want to describe how this, uh, this idea works. So our goal is, I will, uh, so the expander basically addresses this task. Let's say this is a gen bacterial genome, single library. The, the whole genome is closed uh, in uh, a single country with relatively few assembly errors. So how do, how do we do it? What is the idea behind this approach? And what is important in this respect is how to move from assembling creeds to assembling of read paths. And in this case, there is kind of algorithmic deficiency for the approaches for assembling genome from read paths. Because assembling genome from KMERS is basically an elegant De Bruyne graph approach, and then this De Bruyne graph is cleaned a little bit. But assembling genome from paired KMERS often results in not so elegant heuristics. And four years ago, we actually described an elegant, something that I called an elegant 
rigorous approach to assembling of PET cameras using PET de Bruijn graph. And that approach was completely impractical. We had no illusions about this. We stated it in the paper. And essentially what we've been doing at Spades team is trying to turn this approach into something practical. And Expander is kind of already kind of second iteration on how to turn it into something, how to turn this approach into practical. To explain how it's done, I have to introduce the notion of De Bruyne graph I know some of you probably will be bored, but it's maybe the notion of De Bruyne graph you never saw before. It's exactly the same De Bruyne graph as you know, but presented in a different way. Anyway, so give the K spectrum of the genome is simply a set of all K mers in the genome. Okay, so let's assume that we are able to generate all K mers of the genome, the K spectrum, and the goal is to reconstruct genome, let's say in this case from its three spectrum. Okay? Now, uh, the challenge here, you may think, well, the genome is right here. We just need to walk around this circle and we will reconstruct the genome. But reality is that these streamers are not really arranged in the circle. You don't know where each of them is located. Right? So what we can do? Let's suppose, so we have this genome, and let's, for each three mer in the genome, let's construct an edge that will go from uh, the first two mer to the second two mer of the genome. And we label the, the nodes correspondingly. For ATC, it will be an edge from AT to TC. Uh, and we do it for every edge. Note that the last node of the first edge is labeled the same as the first node of the second edge, like this, right? And then I will do this. I will construct all such edges, and then I will glue identically labeled nodes in the graph, okay? So that's what, that's, that's it. I reconstructed the genome after they glued. I got my genome back. And the brain graph of a K spectrum is very simple notion. It, you need to represent every k as a edge between its prefix and suffix. And after all, all nodes with glue all nodes with identical labels. However, if you declare this rule, you really need to follow it strictly. And the keyword here, glue all nodes. All nodes means that you also have to glue these nodes. They label it identically. And you have to glue this one, and this one, and this one. And as a result, after gluing them, you will get this, and you will end up in the same De Bruyne graph you know. And in this De Bruyne graph, genome is an already cycle in the graph, but we don't know how genome traverses this cycle, right? So now we are ready to construct paired De Bruyne graph. So now input is a pairs, pairs of reads, and a paired k mer for us will be a pair's pair of k mer at a fixed distance d apart. For example, CAG and AGC have fixed distance 5 apart. It's a paired k mer And how usual assembler, uh, traditionally assembler, utilize these reads? Well, they map the read pairs to the edges of the graph. Then they find a unique path from the uh, first read to the second read. The lens of this path should match the insert lens. As through this path, they transform read pairs into virtual long reads, and then they essentially assemble long reads. That all sounds good, but it doesn't really work because sometimes there are multiply passes between these edges, and you don't know which path to use to, to turn it into virtual long read. Right? So what would the brain do? under the circumstances. How would De Bruyne utilize the read pairs? And the argue he would construct the paired De Bruyne graph. And the paired De Bruyne graph is very simple if you just switch to a different notion of De, uh, of De Bruyne graph through gluing. You generate all paired three mers from the genome. So this is the three mer. And you construct this paired three mer shown this way. 
and you do it for the second one and for all other three maps, right? Afterwards, the genome disappears, of course. You don't know the genome. And then for every paired three mer in the resulting paired spectrum, you, uh, uh, your goal is to reconstruct genome from this mer. So what you do, you construct an edge, but now it's the edge from paired prefix to paired suffix of every paired three mer, like shown here, right? So this is paired prefix and paired suffix. You do it for every paired three mers, and please note that the same property hold. The end node of the edge is the same as the start label, the starting node of the following edge. And then afterwards, you do absolutely the same. You glue all nodes with identical labels, and that's the paired de Bruyne graph. Represent every paired camera as an edge between its paired prefix and paired suffix, glue all nodes with this identical label. So for paired de Bruyne graph, we still need to connect all nodes with these identical labels, but labels be have become more decorated. So in this case, we will connect this one with this one. Previously, we were connecting this one with this one, but now we do not connect it because they are decorated differently now. So we, and we previously connect, so this one's the only one that we actually have to glue. And after gluing, we get a simpler de Bruyne graph. So this is the benefit, this is the benefit of this approach. And now, let me show you how it would work on simulated data. We would get fantastic assemblies of the human genome if we would get access to the data with these read pairs separated by fixed distance d. Just megabases and mega n50 would be, you know, 25 megabases, let's say. Okay. But this is, of course, a pipe dream because nobody can generate for us read pairs at a fixed distance d. Illumina is coming to this, but it's nowhere close to fixed distance. So what can we do if the distance is not fixed? So let me show you, and it will be the solution that we are using now is the rectangle puzzle. So imagine this image that I showed you in the beginning, cut it into pieces, and it turns into puzzles that you have to assemble. How do you assemble this puzzle? Well, the same way the kids assemble puzzle, they match matching sides. So in this case, it's simple. How about this case? Well, if you try to do this, then it's not that easy because it turns out that there are many possibilities for every part, uh, part of the puzzle to match, right? And in fact, puzzle assembly is a very difficult combinatorial problem. There is no hope to design an algorithm for puzzle assembly. But I will change the puzzle assembly a little bit. You give me a puzzle, and before I give this puzzle to my kid, I will change it a little bit by drawing a red curve through the puzzle. And when you do the assembly, the kid does the assembly, not only the kid has to match uh, sides of the puzzle, but it also should match the red line. Red line becomes a part of the puzzle. So this is uh, a puzzle with a traversing curve that visits every rectangle once. It's important. Okay? Creates more structure to the puzzle. And I want to now to assemble only puzzles like this with this traversing curve. Now, how do I do this? Let's do this. The red curve enters and leaves enter every rectangle at certain side, right? And that's, I call this side source and sink for every piece of rectangle puzzle. And we only consider rectangular puzzles rather than fancy puzzles. It doesn't actually make the problem that much more easy. Okay, and then after I constructed this, I will label this uh, side of rectangle puzzle by basically encoding of the sign. So everything here is a bit, and I will simply use encoding for every color for every position here. Complex encoding, but basically I just want to enforce that sides match by labeling sides. Okay, 
And my goal is to generate all solution of the rectangle puzzle. How would you, I solve this problem? Well, what we described before constructing De Bruyne graph is a general construction that actually naturally extends here. What I will do, I represent each rectangle in the puzzle as an edge. Uh, and this uh, sizes of the edge, the beginning of the edge will be labeled by the label of the source and the uh, final uh, vertex of the edge will be able by the label of the thing, essentially encoding of colors on the side. And then the only thing I need to do is to apply in the brain graph glue identically labeled nodes. So for this puzzle, the result will be this graph, and I simply need to find oil radian Radians, every, every solution of the puzzle will correspond to a radian cycle in the rectangle graph. Okay? Now, it sounds simple, but it's not as simple as it looks like. Because reality is that there is a big difference between what we have for traditional De Bruyne graphs and rectangle assembly. Not all Eulerian cycles correspond to a puzzle assembly. You can actually construct a radian puzzle that doesn't make sense in terms of it will lead to conflicts in puzzle assembly because there are any other sides that are important to take into account. Geometry is wrong. And that's why I'm actually designing a slightly different, even easier puzzle for my kid. Instead of designing traversing curve through the puzzle, I will simply have one red traversing line. Now, the, the meaning of the puzzle seems to disappear now but I now don't request to assemble into rectangular grid. I only require to assemble this into whatever part. Assemble only pieces that have this red line. Okay? And so my goal is assemble rectangles into a subgrid formed by a rectangle crossed by the red, by the red line. And after I've done this, then this condition, already unconditioned hold, that uh, so my goal is once again to assemble this not in the full grid but in the subgrid crossed by red line uh, and now each solution of the puzzle corresponds to an Eulerian cycle and also each Eulerian cycle corresponds to a solution of the puzzle so it's exactly like in the framework of traditional De Bruyne graph and looking at you I see that you have a question here. Here's the question. Where is the genome? What it has to do with the genome? So I need five more minutes to explain that I have been talking about the genomes. So I just need to show you how to construct the rectangle puzzle from reads. And if you think that this puzzles with butterflies and frogs is complex, the genome puzzles that we construct will be much more complex. But the same methods will apply. Okay? So let's construct. It's the last part of my talk. Hopefully I will be done in seven, five, seven minutes. Uh, so here's my genome. I represent the genome as a sequence of K-mers. Okay? And a K-D-mer is a pair of K-mers separated by a distance d in the genome, okay? So this is a KD map shown at the bottom. And now I will do the following. I will assign a color, unique color, to every k mer So there, are, there will be four to the power k colors. And I represent every KD mer as a square color it like this. Top rectangle in the square will be colored by the first k mer the second one will be colored by the second camera. Okay? Now, suppose now we have a genome. Given a genome, I can construct its De Bruyne graph from camera. This is the De Bruyne graph. This is at the bottom, there is genome. In the De Bruyne graph, there are special vertices that are branching vertices that I show by red at the bottom. I, I will pay attention to these red vertices. Okay? Those are basically branching vertices in my De Bruyne graph. Now, allow me to move the De Bruyne graph, and I also will draw exactly the same genome along y-axis. 
Now, I need more space here in this plot, so allow me to move the De Bruyne graph to the left. Now, I have, these are all k-mers from the genome, right, on the x-axis, all k-mers in the genome. So for, on the intersection of two k-mers is a pair at k-mer, right? Not necessarily at distance d, but a pair of k-mers. Every pair of k-mer is a square, colored square, colored by two colors, corresponding to colors of these k-mers. So allow me to fill all this uh, plot by these cameras. That's how it will look like. <laughs> OK? This is not a puzzle yet. This is just a, a nice picture. How I will form a puzzle from this? Well, I have this. Let me, there are too many colors. Let me remove them. You will just keep in mind that there are colors in the figure, right? So I will simply do this. I will cut it according to my red notes. That will be pieces of my puzzle. So I will cut it above every red node. I will do this. OK? So uh, and this is my genome puzzle. OK? But yes? I'm thank you for this question. I'm a terrible educator. The red color here has nothing to do with this red. I should, I should remember this. It's very confusing. Next time I will use a different color. It's just I didn't think about this. Don't think about red color here as red line. But your question is absolutely right. To assemble puzzle, we also need red line. Otherwise, it's hopeless. What will be our red line here from the perspective of the genome? How will we find the red line? Well, remember, we actually have KD mers from the genome. What corresponds to this KD mers? Well, it corresponds to a line, right? So this and this are distance 5 apart. This and this are distance 5 apart. It corresponds to the red line crossing this puzzle, right? Because every KD mer is a sync on this. So as a result, we are only interested in these rectangles. And clearly, if we assemble this puzzle, we assemble the genome because we simply read from the labels of these red vertices the corresponding three mers from the genome. Right? So the only thing we need is to assemble this puzzle. Yes? Because the red line will give us the genome, will reveal the genome. And that's all. That's it. We've done. Right? But this setup is completely useless because I constructed the puzzle from the genome. So yes, if you are given the genome, you can construct the puzzle and you can assemble this puzzle and return this genome back. But in reality, you don't have the genome in the beginning. You only have reads. So the question is, can I construct the same puzzle from the reads? Right? Let's think about this. Let's start. Let's assume that we have KD mers. Assuming that we have KD mers. So, can we construct sides of the puzzle from the reads? Well, given the puzzle, we can construct De Bruyne graphs, right? Each side of the puzzle is essentially a Kantian and De Bruyne graph non branching pass. So, for every pair of non branching passes, uh, passes in the graph, Every pair of non-branched passes in the graph define a rectangle like this, right? So this is clear. All pieces of the puzzle can be constructed. But we also need to construct red line. Well, how do we do this? So this is our KD mer. So KD mer, this one, corresponds to, to certain square in this, to certain point here. So we simply then find this red point here from which KD mer. So uh, constructing this red core, red line, is nothing but to encoding the re read pairs, re paired cameras in the realm of this graph. Right? So, 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 so what we do, pieces of the puzzle, 
can be constructed from pairs of non-branching classes in the De Bruyne graph. The De Bruyne graph can be constructed simply from reads. We don't even need paired reads. And K. D. Mayer defines the red line in the graph. We are done. Afterwards, we assemble, simply assemble rectangle using this gluing, and that's it. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense because, so this is, that's what we will do afterwards. It doesn't make sense because we don't have the exact distance between the reads. We multiple sample? Yeah, and you, you can multiple sample. There are many, many issues. So instead of this red line, we actually have a red cloud. And what is important is from this red clouds, and that's a big part of uh, expander algorithm, you need to estimate accurately where the red line is passing through. And you need to construct this De Bruyne graph, do this gluing, not precisely, but maybe glue even if there are pieces of the puzzle do not match like quite exactly up to epsilon. And basically that's uh, how I currently view assembly, not as one dimensional puzzle, but rather two dimensional puzzle. I think I'm still on time, there are two minutes left, so there is time for the uh, most important slide here. This is a uh, space team in St. Petersburg. I, I'll see them tomorrow, actually. Uh, I'm flying from here to St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, very talented people. It was a pleasure working with them. Actually, this work was done in collaboration with these, uh, people at UCSD. Uh, Paul Medvedev, who was my postdoc now at uh, Penn State. Son Farm was my student now at Sal. Glenn Tesler, my colleague at the Department of Mathematics, and Mark Chason, who is now at the University of Washington. And that's it. There is some trade-off here. So currently, next era made pair can generate library uh, 10 KB, accurate library with this 10 KB. And I heard that there are experimental limitation in sample preparation going further through this. But 10 KB library already, cre already creates some challenges for assembly because there is kind of trade-off. It becomes more difficult, algorithmically more difficult to assemble. So I would currently work at 10 KB level. I think also would become algorithmically more challenging. Is that also the kind of distance you're talking about? Y yes, the distance is standard in search. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so current version, current version of spades works with these distances, a single library of uh, size 10 KB or 7 KB, whatever next error made pairs provide. There are other companies like Lucidgen. Uh, Illumina is not the only company. Nextera technology is not the only technology that is coming uh, that is based on this idea. Oh, like yes. Uh, then you can actually also accomplish yes. basically the same goal. Yes. If, because if you have each, at each set of junctions, you have a main pair that tells you where... I think it is a very promising approach. And I know that, I know at least one person who is moving experimentally in this direction. I, I think it, it will open very interesting algorithmic challenges. New that we didn't see before. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about deployed genomes. Assembling what? Deployed genomes. Deployed genome. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even mention. There is also a version of space for assembling deployed yeah. genome. Yeah. Is that we have several kinds of deployed genomes? <coughs> is it 
No, no. Deep space is has been used in joint projects. Deep space is a genome, is a version of space that is designed for assembling highly polymorphic genome. When like most of the genome we assemble so far, like human genome, are strange artifacts. They are highly inbred. The same way for mouse genome or for rat genome that we are inbred mice. But in nature, most of organisms have much higher rate of polymorphism between, uh, co between corresponding chromosome. And this uh, rate of polymorphism may go to 10%. And even for some fungi, I was amazed, 25%. It is still the same, considered the same species. So we've been doing a lot of work on assembling this. It is extremely challenging assembly problem. We actually don't know other tools that work well uh, for this for this type of assemblies, what? It's very tough. It's right, and uh, so we released Deep Space last year, and we've been working with a number of groups on assembling uh, genome with Space. We actually assembled dozens and dozens of different fungi. So it is definitely uh, a project that Space team supports. So if you're interested, just use it, write them, and I'm sure they will be excited. Yeah, but not for giant genomes that some people in this room assemble because, of, but f for us it's okay, yeah. We actually, actually Spades team, the Spades team went to, uh, was invited to come to International Rice Research Institute in Philippines. Uh, and we've been assembling, they have 300 or 3,000 strains of rice genome, you may know this. And we've been assembling uh, some of this uh, genome for them, but I don't remember that there is a lot of diploidies there. Is there? Oh, no, no. Like, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize we have several more now than one genome. Ah, OK. OK. Like yeah. Like, how, how long did it take? Like months or? Assemble? Yeah. No, it won't take months. But we, we, we routinely have been assembling something that is uh, let's say uh, under 500, 600 million nucleotide, but space is is not working today for assembling larger genomes. So your cloud there, your red line is the cloud. So what 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 happens? Maybe it's just an engineering but we've seen libraries of nucleotides where a significant fraction are oriented the wrong way. Uh, so, yeah, we, so, expand, so when I showed you the slide for Expander, it was just one example. But we worked in an ISMB paper, we present a wide range of examples, and it has to be error tolerant. There is also a non trivial number of chimeric reads and chimeric read paths, and that's where our chimeric tools also help. Uh, but what you are saying, if it is going to extreme, I don't know how it will, how, what will be the result of space.